Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's it's good to see you all here. Um, thanks for being here for the last session of the day, which is always the best session of the day. Um, my name is Jeffrey Sunikawa. Um, I'm currently the director of court services at the Texas uh, AOC in Austin. Um, in my 22, 23 years, I've worked in trial courts. Uh, I've worked in general jurisdiction. I've been worked in limited jurisdiction, uh, currently working at the AOC. So I have seen courts uh, progress, and I've seen them from every level that exists. And I feel your pain. Uh, I feel the, the toughness of the day. So um, as we talk through all, all this, I just want you to know there's some credibility because, uh, because I've been there and done that. And this is my colleague, Brandon. Good afternoon. Uh, join Jeffrey and thanking you for being here. Brandon Kimura, I'm the uh, Policy and Planning Department Director in the Hawaii State Judiciary. I've uh, been in this for a little while. My background is quite different from Jeffrey's. Um, I also have been in courts at different levels, but more as a practitioner. I was a litigator in Indiana for a little while, um, did a clerkship at the uh, Indiana uh, Intermediate Court of Appeals Chief Judge, practiced uh, as a civil litigator in Hawaii for a little while. Um, was a, in chambers with our chief justice as his staff attorney and special assistant, um, and then uh, went to our state court administrator's office where I, where I served for a while as special assistant and uh, deputy state court administrator for six years. So all in the AOC, my time in the trial courts has been uh, in the courtrooms as a practitioner, as a litigator. So different experiences, um, but I, I hope that you folks can glean a lot from our different perspectives here and looking forward to the discussion. So thanks. So. Course and technology, you know, I don't think anyone ever thought those two words would be uttered in the same sentence uh, because courts were always the exact opposite of technology. We didn't use technology. We, we ran away from technology. Um, you know, we, we were, we were an uh, industry that was built on human interaction and papers and, and ink and those types of things. Um, this is not the case anymore, right? Things have drastically changed um, in the last... 30 years, last 20 years, definitely in the last few years. Um, this image that you see is a product of artificial intelligence. Um, just typed in that exact phrase, courts and technology, and that's what artificial intelligence thinks, that people will be replaced with robots. Um, we'll still use courtrooms, but um, we won't need to be there, and we won't be needing to do all the processes because it'll be done for us. Um, but, you know, I think we can all agree that there has been some positive progress um, between the courts and, and the digital age. Uh, the introduction of a lot of new technologies that are making our jobs uh, easier in some ways and, and difficult in some ways. So we're going to kind of take that journey about from kind of where we all started and then talk about, you know, where we're going to and things for you to think about as, as we're making this journey, right? So we can't necessarily just jump in the pool of melding our courts with technology and just assuming it's all going to work. Um, we see some of these struggles when we talk about workforce. So we'll talk about, you know, how strategic we need to be with workforce challenges. Um, you know, we see these issues when, it when we think about our, our court customers that come into our buildings. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about how you need to be strategic about that. So again, um, what we're looking to cover is, is, is up on the screen. Um, you know, we have to take a completely different approach from the way we used to manage courts. Um, it used to be we just filled positions, right? We, we knew what our needs were. We, we, we knew what the basic um, job requirements were. Um, but that's just not the same anymore. Um, we're not able to fill the positions. Either our workforces aren't attractive, um, we're not able to match the pay that people expect. Um, a younger generation um, just doesn't have a, a keen interest in sitting in a chair in a courtroom and, and typing on computers. So, um, you know, we have to be very strategic on our workforce um, and, and meet the changing needs. And those needs are changing rapidly. Um, we're seeing this with the introduction of new technologies such as AI. Um, we have to be very strategic about our, our processes. There's, there's very few things in the judicial branch process that can change overnight. Our processes are typically set out in statute, in the Constitution. The, our directives were, were set out a long time ago, and to change what we do or how we do it um, just doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen quickly. So um, we sort of have to be visionary on uh, you know, what we intend to do and how we're going to do it, and then meeting the expectations of today. Um, 
Yeah, I, th I think um, the pandemic really thrusted um, the public's expectations of courts in a completely different direction. Um, and courts pivoted, you know, we, we implemented technology, we changed our processes, um, but um, those things, again, are changing rapidly, particularly with uh, artificial intelligence. So how has technology changed courts in recent years? This is, this is the, the life of what you used to have in courts 30 years ago. Um, all those people that you interact in, in your grocery store, those are our customers. All those people that you pass by on the street, those are our customers. Um, all walks of life, all educational backgrounds, speaks English, doesn't speak English, speaks a dialect you've never heard of, finding interpreters. That's, that, that was our struggles before. That's, that, that was kind of what we dealt with before. You know, our business was eight to five. I mean, are, are our businesses eight to five anymore? Does, does the court stop? Does do the function stop? No, we have, you know, e-filing allows attorneys to sort of continue to work and get their documents to court at all hours of the night and all hours of the day. We have technology problems that pop up at six o'clock in the morning and it wakes up our IT directors and they're dealing with that. Um, so, you know, as much as we used to think that we opened the doors at eight o'clock and then locked them at five, court processes have really gone outside those business hours. Traffic and parking, that used to be like the hallmark of what we dealt with. How did we get people to our courts? How do we get hundreds of jurors to report to a single location on the same day, in addition to all the other people that need to be there? At the same time, too, correct. Um, that, you know, that, that truly was like the hallmark problem that people dealt with. How do we efficiently bring people to the courthouses and deal with things like parking and those types of things? And the security has always been an underlying issue of problems we face in our traditional courts. So these, these are what we always consider the big problems of courts. This is what we spent hours dealing with. This is what we had meetings dealing with. We also just dealt with the volume of cases coming in. You know, I remember working in King County Superior Court and our chief civil court, um, on, on an average day, uh, they would get filings from the floor probably to about here because asbestos cases, um, you know, high level civil disputes, you know, binders this thick. That was, that was a typical chief civil courtroom when we didn't have something like e-filing. So we were dealing with, you know, how does the mail room handle that? Um, you know, dealing with things like formatting and legibility. Legibility was an issue before, um, and, and those things have really changed. Again, that was the traditional court, and we're no longer living in a traditional court environment. So what, what is really driving all these changes? Do you feel like when you go outside that everywhere you look, there's a camera staring you in the face? Like wherever you go, there is a camera now. When you walk up to your neighbor's house, there is a camera that you're looking into. Um, and it amazes me, street corners. You know, if you just happen to go to an, a downtown street corner and look up, I don't know what half those devices do anymore. I would typically recognize like a speeding traffic cam. There's a ton of cameras out there now, and I don't know what they're doing or what they're capturing or who's using it, but those are everywhere. Um, Phones, I mean, you know, I never know when someone's walking by me if they're, you know, live streaming on, on Instagram and recording me and, and making fun of the way I'm dressed. Um, but, you know, cameras are just taking over society. Um, you know, that first image, um, body cams for, for our, our law enforcement, that's become an expectation now and it's become one of the biggest hindrances on the way courts operate. Digital evidence is becoming a thing that's bogging down our courts, but that's driving the way we do business. All these things right here are just, those five things are just driving our processes. So we're having to pivot and react to the way we do things. Um, and a lot of this is, is doable because we were forced to learn how to pivot from the pandemic, right? We were forced to bring traditional processes online in a remote environment. We were forced to be able to interact with the public and um, process marriage licenses remotely. That was never a big thing before, but now it's an expectation. So although this is not our, 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 our technique that we were brought up and trained on, we've mastered it in a way. Um, but as I put on there, we're constantly learning and rarely mastering. And that's because technology is moving faster 
than we are. And that's why what we want to talk about is being more strategic in these processes. Um, we don't have the resources um, to pivot that fast. We don't have the budgets to pivot that fast. Um, and we certainly just don't have the time. Um, our courts are spending their eight hours a day processing cases and dealing with customers. Um, I mean, how often do you actually get to strategic planning? And when you do, how often do you follow through with strategic planning? It used to be a, a notebook that sat on your bookshelf. It's probably now a PDF document that's sitting in your, your OneDrive. Um, so as much as courts and, and uh, the judicial branch really tries to be visionary and look ahead, um, we continue to fall back. Um, so we just really need to be more strategic about that. Oh, and I, I agree. I mean, particularly with the last two about constantly learning and rarely mastering. I mean, this is a big change because many of our folks in our courts, um, for good reason, and we're very grateful, have been there doing their job, serving the public for years. And they've learned their craft and they've learned it and they've refined it and they've figured out a way to do it in a way that is efficient and it gets the job done and it serves the public and then they've done that for another 10 years. Many of the best managers know that they're constantly learning their job, they're constantly learning new, new circumstances and adjusting, but something that's been, I would argue, a little bit different in more recent years is you're not getting to the mastery stage because things just continue to evolve and evolve and evolve at a much faster rate. So that may be something new. And that's something that I think courts need to get a little more familiar with and used to being that uncomfortable. We're not going to get to mastery. Um, and the last one, which is the risks are more frequent and complicated, as we've seen in the last week or so, things are much more integrated and um, uh, intertwined. Um, how many folks have had their courts impacted by the crowd strike incident a few days ago? And I'm sure some that aren't here as well. How many folks have had their personal lives or travel plans impacted by the crowd strike? And so that was uh, unrelated to a cybersecurity incident, but it does demonstrate how integrated things are within a lot of different systems. And it should not suggest that we should shy away from some of these things because crowd strike and other um, companies that do similar services are, are absolutely necessary, but it, it's an example of how things are integrated and we need to be mindful and able to pivot and able to adapt and find alternative ways of doing things on a dime. So. How many of you have been to Panera Bread? Most of you. <laughs> um, how many of you bank with Bank of America? A lot of you. Ticketmaster? These are our concert goers. Any idea what all these companies have in common? All of these companies in the last 60 days have either had a cyber attack or a ransomware attack. So all of you doing business with these people better go search the dark web for your contact information. It just goes to show it doesn't matter the magnitude of your business or the amount of resources and FTEs you have working in IT and cybersecurity. There's no one that's immune from this. So if companies like Dropbox, which probably a lot of you are using for digital evidence, um, if people are banking at bank, if, if they're not immune from this, our courts are not immune from this. Um, there's no one from LA Superior Court here, is it right? LA, LA uh, most of California um, had a budget issue and wasn't able to attend the conference. But if you don't know, um, today is, a, is an unofficial holiday for LA Superior Court because they had a ransomware attack last night. And every court in LA uh, is shut down today. So if you know, if any of you know David Slayton, he's crying on someone's shoulder right now. Um, so again, doesn't matter, matter the magnitude of your jurisdiction, large or small, you're not immune to it and it will likely happen to you. Um, and these are the challenges that we're all facing in this new age, right? 
Um, digital is supposed to be helpful for our courts, um, but it's taking down major companies like this. It's taking down major courts like LA Superior Court. It's taking down our airlines the last few days. Um, I just kind of put that out there for you just to start thinking of, you know, you, you probably hear it in the news, but it's starting to hit closer and closer to home, um, especially when you couldn't get here. Um, I had the question of whether or not I can actually get back home on Thursday. I'm not sure. We, we all might be stuck here on Thursday because our flights are going to be canceled. Just saying. At least there's good food, right? Um, but this is something that everyone just constantly has to be working at. We constantly have to be making sure that we're protecting our data. Um, and that's, you know, that really should be the forefront, you know, all the data and the, the private, private information we're collecting, making sure people feel like they can trust the courts with that data. If, if we're forcing them to come in and forcing them to provide that information, then we should be safeguarding it. And we should be doing all we can to safeguard it. Um, there are a lot of best practices out there. Um, a lot of courts have been through this. Texas uh, was hit with a ransomware attack just a few years ago. Um, Alaska was hit with a ransomware attack just a couple years ago. Georgia was. Um, so again, um, just be prepared um, that, that technology does have its side effects that we should be aware of. So these are just some really small steps forward that courts have made in technology. And I say very small because I think there's a lot more um, larger advances Court apps have become um, probably not as common. Um, I don't think um, a lot of courts have the resources to develop court apps, but um, I know a lot of courts in California ha have their own court app. Um, and portals are becoming very common. I mean, that's we all have usernames and passwords for, for most companies because they have these portals, but um, courts are finding it um, more and more uh, efficient to create these portals so that you can do your one-stop shopping uh, if you happen to have a lot of cases or hearings with courts. Online payments have been around for a long time. These, um, you know, chatting and texting with court staff, um, you know, that, that has been um, a technology that's been around for a long time. Courts just haven't necessarily um, jumped at that because it does take a person to utilize that. And we'll talk about how AI plays into that a little bit later. Um, Self-help kiosk, um, you know, I think a lot of courts thought that self-help kiosk would be super helpful, um, particularly in states that have a lot of rural jurisdictions um, or um, there's just a larger population and we can't get to them. Um, I, you know, I'm working with John Meeks, or, or not John Meeks, John Grecian right now. Um, Texas, you know, did a, one of the organizations in Texas did a project where they deployed 25 self-help kiosks. And um, when, when Grecian and his uh, colleague came in and did a uh, evaluation, they're not getting used. You know, we just, hoped that this technology and these resources, that if we just sort of pushed it to the people that need it, that it would be utilized, and it's just not being utilized. Um, there's, there's, there always has to be a human component, right? So when, when John Smith comes to use the kiosk and he doesn't understand how to find his case number or, or anything like that, he, he needs a human to help him. Um, and that human is probably a volunteer that's working at the organization where that kiosk is and has no idea how to work that kiosk. So um, it is, it is a, a tool, um, but is it the best tool? And obviously um, using um, data, data dashboards, and you know, th the session is not about data dashboards, but that's one way that courts have really embraced um, using online technology to make courts more efficient and more transparent. And I think um, courts can go a long way in that area. I hope you're all familiar with uh, remote hearings and virtual courts. It's so funny when I when I have talked about this before. Um, you know, in the bottom left, you probably recognize it's a Polycom phone, right? When I was working early in the courts, we called them space phones, because you know back in the day that was like the coolest thing. And if you were a courtroom, you were lucky if you could get your hands on a space phone. I literally I remember in in Seattle we had 51 judges. I think they all shared five space phones, so you would check it out and move it from courtroom to courtroom. And but that was the coolest thing, you know, for remote technology. But it also just shows that remote technology has been around for a long time. We we've had the ability to bring people into our courtrooms remotely for years. 
Telephone has always been that mechanism, and it still is that mechanism. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, back in the day, a lot of mental health hearings were conducted virtually. Um, it was sort of the early adopters of video technology because courts were afraid to allow public into the same room as those with involuntary treatment types of hearings or mental health hearings. Um, so those were early adopters of video technology, but phone remote technology has literally just been around forever. Um, and I think we forget about that, but this is sort of the evolvement of of remote hearings or virtual hearings where we're, although, you know, a lot of states and jurisdictions are taking those steps back because, you know, things like this are complicated. <laughs> Wheeling in TVs, um, getting access codes, um, and then just the sheer just exhaustion of sitting in front of screens. You know, there, there are a lot of courts that are going back to step one, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It still works, and it's, it's the traditional process. Um, but there are times when it's probably not the best approach. And we're just, you know, a lot of courts are still just embracing this type of, of technology where we don't all need to be in the same room. Um, if, if, the, if the purpose of bringing everyone together is to share information and share content, I don't, I don't necessarily need someone sitting across from me. Um, so, again, it just depends on the circumstance. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, you know, th there are rational, legitimate reasons for, for the court's historic and current approach to the, some of these things, of course, right? So it's, you know, as a, as a litigator, as a practitioner, as a court who's dealing, who's dealing with people's rights and, you know, perhaps often the worst day of their life and rights under the constitution or significant things under the state laws, there, that's a very compelling reason to want to have somebody there and present and fully there and fully engaged to, invite them, give them that opportunity, and often sometimes compel them to be there. Um, that said, you know, one thing that, as Jeffrey kind of alluded to, push courts forward light years ahead is the change in societal expectations. Um, courts were not the only ones that were reluctant to move forward, but particularly during the pandemic, if we didn't, we would have been the only industry and that was, I think, very compelling to helpful, moving courts in a, in a particular direction. And now that things have settled down a little bit, courts are sort of figuring out where do we want to be? Do we want to be where we were, where we, the where we've moved over the last three or four years, or somewhere in between, or something else? And jurisdictions are obviously taking different approaches, and that's you know based on the justice, the judicial officers' views, um, you know AOC's views. Uh, often an individual trial judge's views, um, and of course feedback from from judges and and the community, and just sort of what's going on in the community, where that community is in terms of adjusting to you know how how mobile or electronic uh, or other services and government agencies in that community as well, and that leads into a little bit of the you know complexity of hybrid, right? So getting people in person is tough. They got to you got to get them there. You got to get them the right time. You got to get them through traffic. You got to Make sure there's parking for them. Uh, remote is a different kind of challenge because you got to make sure there's um, digital access and other things like that, which are very different challenges. Hybrid is, of course, the most complicated, right? And that's ironically what a lot of folks believe would be a middle ground is the most complicated way to do it. Um, and so the, we're we're working through that both in terms of in the courtrooms and then certainly in the front of the office and the back of the office. Um, about how we're going to schedule our folks and what, what we're going to, how we're going to engage with court users um, and others in the justice system, and that's it is it is ironic, but I think somewhat simplified because if we don't want to go all the way back, and it, for some courts who don't want to stay all the way and and continue to go down this path of going less and less people face to face, the natural compromise is the most complicated way to do it. And that that's just something that we're working through, right? So. And you know, Brandon makes a really good point about <clears throat> sometimes society and the community is the driver of the change or of the lack of change in the way we do our work. Um, one of the presentations I do in Texas is um, I talk about um, comparing uh, the amount of users that were using certain technologies, you know, 15 years ago to now, you know. <coughs> the percentage of people that had laptops or that had tablets um, or that had broadband and then comparing that to the stats of 
what that looks like even two years ago. And what I always emphasize is even two years ago, it, none of those stats are at 100%. That means there is a certain percent of people that lack broadband, that lack technology, that lack access to a phone. So I don't think we should ever design our, our services around the majority um, and, and forget about that one and 2% that can't participate because of that. Um, we always just need to keep in mind that in some of those communities, um, the majority is, shouldn't really be driving the change. Um, we should always keep in mind of the, the minority. So this is one of the things that, that Brian and I have talked about quite a bit because um, technology has really changed our processes and our operations. Um, but one of the other things that's really you know, hit on is, is the personnel. It's, it's the people in this room, it's the people that are back at home, you know, doing the work that you know you would typically supervise and manage. Um, it's impacting the the stakeholders that are coming into our work establishments to get the work done, um, and those expectations are really changing. So, you know, one of the first um, recommendations that came out on the study of uh, virtual hearings was the role of a technical bailiff. Um, Twenty years ago, what the heck is that? Um, the, the bailiff really has no role other, you know, in some jurisdictions, they're, they're security. They're there just to kind of keep peace and order in the courtroom. Um, in other courts, um, you know, they're more of a judicial assistant, um, helping to um, be a, a in between between a clerk um, and the judge or, um, you know, receiving paperwork in, in the court. Um, these days, they're expected to um, schedule Zoom hearings um, and tell people that their camera is off or tell people um, to clear their cookies and cash. Like, all of a sudden, this, this term technical bailiff came out, and we're expecting someone to perform those job duties, but we don't, no one has the extra resources to create an, an FTE just to do that type of work. Our judges in the last several years have been technical bailiffs. Um, I hear over and over from judges about their frustration that they spend so much time just trying to get parties together on a Zoom call where you can see and you can hear and they're fully clothed and, and those types of things. Um, that's, that still happens to this day. Um, so, you know, all these positions have changed. You know, attorneys, you know, the expectations of attorneys has also just evolved. Um, we expect attorneys to do more than they used to. And I think I think that was always sort of a wish for courts. They, they always wished attorneys would take an extra step and, and do things for themselves. But it seems like often when attorneys come to courtrooms, they're just juvenile kids who have no idea what they're doing, even though they went to law school and they know what the processes are. They depend on court staff to, to get their work done for them. But um, technology has just really impacted the way all those people do their work. Um, and who's, who's teaching this? Um, are we still being taught anything? I, we had this conversation at work, um, you know, rolling out new software, and someone asked, um, "When's the training?" <laughs> what training? <laughs> we don't do training, <laughs> you know. And that's the sad part is that there's this expectation that all humans can just figure it out. That whatever new technology, whatever new software is rolled out, whatever new process is that we'll just figure it out on our own, on our own time. Um, digital learning is not for everyone. Um, there is a lot of that out there. Um, you know, we, at REOC, we've invested in online portals so that people can go and, and learn on their own um, in a digital era. But the assumption is that next week you should be able to figure out how to use that new software. And that's what happened with with um, you know the virtual hearings when when COVID hit. We just expected our court customers to log on and, and do their part. And, you know, to the layperson that interacts with our court, that is not their, their, their technique, that is not their skill set to participate in virtual court hearings. And it, certain, it certainly wasn't the, the skill set of, of court staff. Um, but then we, we think about judges and staff and attorneys, you know, our concern should be, do our judges know how to run a courtroom? Do our judges know what the current law is in criminal and civil. Um, do our, our, you know, do they, do they know how to do their job as a judge? Um, they're not gonna go to their new judge training and be trained on how to set up a Zoom hearing. 
or how to uh, troubleshoot sound issues. Um, and I think that's really falling on us. Um, we're, we're now becoming the, the SMEs uh, to train our judges and our staff on how to do everything. Um, and that has really been a thing that has changed a lot in the last five or six years. And this is slide is really just to, I guess, highlight that there are new opportunities in recent years for training, education, and development, and primarily in the area of education. I'll distinguish the three of them in a moment. But in the area of education for our staff, um, you've heard uh, a lot so far, and you'll continue to hear about NACOM's core uh, curricula and how that may provide a really solid foundation for any court professionals and anyone who works in the court. Um, there are new educational pathways for future court professionals. Um, in the programs at traditional uh, educational institutions at universities have uh, fallen by the wayside uh, over the years, but there have been other areas that have picked it up. Um, one of them is the National Center's uh, Institute for Court Management, which provides uh, phenomenal opportunities. Of course, NACOM's core, uh, NACOM and other organizations have lots and lots of webinars on very specific issues, which is different than it was five years ago. It's a very, very different um, landscape. Um, and of course, online education, whether it's external, such as like Coursera or other similar sites, or internal sites like Jeffrey was alluding to, um, you know, a lot of courts have their online uh, education site. Um, the educational pathways, so that, you know, because of the things that we're talking about here with technology and other aspects of courts and the justice system changing drastically, um, there are new generations of professionals. Um, there are also different opportunities as licensed legal professionals um, grows and in influence in different states. Um, these are where um, folks who are licensed uh, paraprofessionals or uh, folks who um, are certified to do a particular job, um, that, but uh, not a law degree, but they can do significant amounts of very impactful work. Um, the states, the many more states are sort of acknowledging that, training that, and certifying them to do that particular work, which can be a huge help on bandwidth for court staff, lawyers, and others in the community, um, can be very impactful. Um, so another moment on training, education, and development. And that, to me, is, is significant to distinguish the three. And it's really most significant to ensure that uh, us and our staff have enough in each of those three buckets. So training is how to do your job. Do you have enough training so that you know how to run a Zoom hearing or a Zoom meeting or whatever it is? Do you know how to enter the case um, information in the in the case management system and other training that you have for a new employee? The education are more of the foundational aspects. This is why we do things this way. Purpose and responsibilities of courts, um, budget, fiscal, um, case flow and workflow management. Those are the kind of foundational pieces of how we do and why we do what we do. Um, and the development, are the professional development opportunities. These are the special projects from a supervisor that help to, you, they assign you so that you can grow. These are coming to NACOM conferences so that you can meet other people and expand your mind and your imagination and see what else is out there and what might be possible. And so training, education, and development are often, you know, people use the, the words interchangeably and, oh, that person is doing one or, or the other. But I, I clarify the three of them, and this is just my framing, if you will, but I clarify the three of them because I think they're three different and each element is, is important. Um, and so if you're identifying that, you know, perhaps to uh, help one of your employees or to motivate one of your employees or any of the other good reasons to um, offer them some of these things, try to identify what it is that they might need more specifically. Do they need a little more training? Do they need more educational? Uh, education, or do they need some kind of development opportunity? If if you're a manager and you sent someone to this conference, good for you. If you're someone and your manager sent you to this conference, thank your manager. If you're a manager and you didn't send someone to this conference, I encourage you to go back and think about who you could send next time. Um, I, I brought a team of three of my staff here and I think that they're truly enjoying this. I know they're being exposed to a lot of topics that they probably never would have been exposed to in their day job. Um, that development is truly beneficial in the long run. Um, those are the people that are gonna be taking those higher level positions that you're gonna have trouble filling in the future. 
Um, recruiting from within is always a, a beneficial thing. Um, but if we're not allowing them these opportunities, they're not going to be able to grow. Um, and we're not the only ones that need this training and development and education. Um, all, of, all of our staff back home need it. So just encourage you to, to make sure that um, you consider bringing these opportunities to, to your staff as well. Um, paradigm shifts in skills and experience. This sort of elaborates upon that just to sort of acknowledge that the skills and experience necessary to do the job today and the job of tomorrow is not the same as the job of yesterday. Um, the traditional skill sets that folks who worked in the justice system had are essential and critical and remain important, um, but they're a smaller and smaller portion of our entire mission. Um, doesn't mean that's lessening in importance. It means that other things are growing in importance and we've got to do those things too. We've got to find a way to do them. We've got to find a way to do them efficiently with limited resources that we have. Um, and so, you know, one more concrete area is job descriptions. And um, I know for our court and then Jeffrey's mentioned for his, and I'm sure for many of you folks, as a vacancy comes up, or maybe even if it's not vacant, we're revising job descriptions. The jobs today are very different and they're gonna continue to be different. If you're fortunate enough to have um, a handful of vacancies, or I guess in some way, I guess to be creative, um, or thinking about the future, then you may think about, okay, strategically, what is gonna be the job two years from now or five years from now? So you can advance it, revise these descriptions ahead of time, right? So that you're ready. Where am I going? I, I wanna have one person doing this particular function, but it's gonna, this office, this new function is gonna grow. So I want it to eventually be able to, for, to, uh, to have three people in that area. Um, the importance of adaptability and digital literacy, um, job demands obviously changing rapidly. I did my fellows project in 2019, just before the pandemic. It was on recruiting and retaining court employees in the new era. And this was before the pandemic. And then as I was finalizing my paper in early March of 2020, I said, oh, fellows program is on pause because we've got this thing going on. And the idea of my project was, I felt that there was something that courts were on the cusp of a new era in some way for recruiting and retaining employees. And what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? And how are we gonna adjust? So as part of my paper, I reached out to state court administrators. And one of the questions I asked was, what are the skills of employees of the future courts gonna need? But these are pretty, very smart people. They know the, what's out there, what, what the courts might need. And the number one thing that was, I think unanimous of all respondents was adaptability. Court employees of the future need to be adaptable. Every single person said that. And that is, it came true, right? That's where we are today. That's where we're gonna to be tomorrow. I mean, how often do you review your job descriptions? I mean, only when the vacancy occurs? It's generally like the, the default time, right? If someone leaves, you need to hire, just making sure. Um, how often do you change the minimum requirements? I mean, have, have those changed? I, I think they have a little bit. You know, it's, it, is it really just, you know, proficient in Microsoft Office? Like, I feel like that's like the standard, like, minimum, like must be able to sit for extended hours, must be able to lift, you know, 15 pounds and be proficient in Microsoft Office. But, you know, I, I have um, been fortunate to hire a lot of new positions lately. Um, and I just find that that's become a, a really helpful exercise of just dissecting those job descriptions because, I think a lot of people just sort of go to whatever like the state classification job description says, because that's the easiest way to do it, right? All you want to do is get the job posting out there and start recruiting because every day that passes becomes harder and harder because you don't have someone doing the job. So why not just adapt what the, the, the state job description or the county job description says and, you know, sort of bypass, you know, minimum requirements, of course, minimum requirements haven't changed, but have they changed? You know, would changing your minimum requirements net you different people with different skill sets. Um, are, are we being too specific um, in, in our, our, our minimum requirements? Um, you know, think of those things because I know, I know for a fact you're all dealing with recruitment issues, right? 
Because if you aren't, I want to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> I, have, I have a job I've posted and reposted and reposted, and I'm lucky if I get a single person that I think is qualified for the job, um, which has made me go back and look at minimum requirements. But um, you know, I, I think that's a good habit to get in is to constantly just question your job descriptions and question the, the minimum requirements because our requirements have changed in this whole new digital era. And you know, as, as we kind of shift to part two is the more um, strategic portion of the presentation, just how we're thinking ahead. I mean, just another point on the job descriptions and think about what the functional needs you might have in the future when you're revising them. And so as an example, how will our courts need to adjust to AI? Well, we have an AI guide that's coming out, you should read it. Um, but that may inform how you, whether it's revising a specific job description or think about your work unit or how your work unit relates to other work units in your court or at the AOC, where are you gonna set up an AI type related job? Is that in IT or is it in HR or is it in operations? Um, where might that be? But maybe more importantly, where do you and who do you have the discussion with? Um, that's a way to really engage strategically as to how am I planning for the future? Because I think for a lot of folks who are like, well, it's definitely not in my unit. So somebody also think about it and somebody else will figure it out. Um, so this second part, we're going to talk about how do we strategically plan for today and for the future. And there have been a lot of discussions, um, and there are a lot of discussions going on at this session about being strategic and how you do that um, as with the plenary speaker, how you be strategic with developing your staff and getting things done. Um, there's, I think, a session either going on now or will be about implementing a strategic plan. Um, Ken did a phenomenal presentation of also about strategic planning. Ours is how to be strategic with the idea that technology is coming at us fast and it is here and some of us are more ready than others. And how do we not only react effectively, but hopefully drive it and be the future towards using, I think Ken's term, the preferred future of the courts. All right, so that's where this part two is about um, for our technology. And this is quite small for folks in the back. As a reminder, we have this in the, the slides. The slide deck is in the app. Um, strategic thinking about now and the future. The strategic sixes, these are two sets of six questions that are from um, ICM's uh, Visioning and Strategic Planning course, which is a phenomenal course. And um, it's, it's just outstanding. Um, the first six is, uh, these are really to help you identify a line of sight. And so as we talk about the world changing and technology changing and our operations changing and the people we interact with changing, and are we adjusting to society or are we just following the laws and different views on some of these things and new employees and what are the purposes and responsibilities? These six help us develop a line of sight so that each of the employees understands how they can be connected to the mission of the courts and the purposes of the courts. Uh, so they understand what uh, everyone along the chain of command, if you will, is identifying and thinking about. And this is just a really good discussion to have. So just as a, I'll just read out for folks in the back. Uh, what is the court here to do? How do you, uh, how do your various roles contribute to what the court is here to do? What should we be held accountable for? What should you be held accountable for? Just sort of imagine having that conversation sitting across from someone in a one-on-one. -on -one. And you're like, I'm your manager, I'm here, let's talk. You know, it's, I'm interested in feedback and I wanna ask you some specific questions. What should we be accountable for? Okay, they've shared their thoughts. What should you be accountable for? Let's think about how powerful that kind of discussion would be. Um, what, are, what are the major challenges to your work? And what do you need to do your work better? This is not about a confrontational issue. It's not about a gotcha to, to folks you're having this discussion with. It's identifying the barriers so that you can help, right? And whether it's someone who's reporting to you or a colleague um, to help understand where people are coming from, what's challenging them and how we can work, how we can move forward. Um, and related to the, um, you know, you might think about how technology fits into this discussion. When you think, when you ask, what do you need to do your work better? 
you can sort of have in your mind, might there be a technological tool that I can use to help this person, right? The second set of questions, a uh, second set of six questions are, I think, helpful in identifying uh, in input or gathering input from various stakeholder groups. So whether it's internals among your colleagues in the courts or others in the justice system, as you're getting into a new project, a lot, there's always new task forces or working groups being formed. And particularly when a lot of new issues are coming up, we've, we've got a group to think about it and talk about it. And there's just a good way to kind of understand where people are coming from, from different stakeholder perspectives. What are the past accomplishments in this area? What can and should we be proud of and what can we build upon? Uh, what are the current strengths and the current weaknesses in this area? A little mini SWOT analysis. Uh, what should we do more of? What should we do less of? Everyone's got lots to say, but what should we do less of? <laughs> right? And what are the future accomplishments? Where are we headed? What do we want to say a few months from now or a few years from now that we're really proud that this has happened because we work together and we work together well? So I just commend these to you as, as two sets of six questions that are really helpful to, to identify where we are and where we're going and how we might get there. And it's really primarily a listening exercise. It's a very specific way to hear what people are thinking, and then you can work through that. I, I, I wanted to put two people on the spot um, because I, I trust them and I trust their, their thoughts. Um, so now, what are courts here to do? To be a forum where disputes are resolved. Is that it? No, that's not it. That's <laughs> like the basics of it. <laughs> um, to do it in a way that is respectful to people, to do it timely, to do it in accordance with the uh, statutes and rules that are out there. There's a lot of different things that'll hit around. Cordell, what are courts here to do? Courts are here for the fair administration of justice. And they are also here to be of public service. Uh, when we think about courts, um, our courts are one place that the public has to come. It's not like McDonald's versus Burger King. They can't decide not to come to our courthouse. So we have to be really uh, thoughtful about um, providing that service. We have to be thoughtful about the customer service, but also uh, interacting with each other, our leaders, the employees, and just the whole team. So courts have a, uh, plenty of uh, responsibilities, uh, but at the end of the day, it's the fair and impartial administration of justice. If we started selling Big Macs, we'd probably get more people to court. <laughs> um, the only reason I did that is because how often do you do, you do that? How often do you, do, you, do you sit back and think, what, what is the purpose of my business, of my court, and what I do? Um, and so if you sit there and you think about it and you, you kind of stumble a little bit until you really get there. Um, how often do you ask your staff, what are courts there to do? Um, I think most of us probably got into the profession, just sort of stumbled into it. Um, my first job, my very first professional job, and my first job in the, was within the courts, and my title was Technical Information Processing Specialist 2. I was super proud. My job was to um, contact all 51 courts uh, in King County and find out what they were doing that day and then put that on a, a legal size Word document uh, called the Daily Calendar. And I would print about 200 copies of that and put it in the lobby for people. So when they came to the courthouse, they knew where to go and how to find what they thought they were looking for. That was my job 22 years ago. I sort of stumbled into that. 22 years ago, if you would have asked me that question, I, I don't think I would have come even close to that. Um, I, I, I think I probably would have said something about jury duty. That's probably all I knew. Um, but I think, you know, as a strategic step, um, it's good to have those conversations with your staff. Do your staff understand their role in the court? Do they understand their purpose in the courts and what the purpose of courts are for? Um, make them appreciate their role 
a little more um, because that, that will help downstream. Um, the more people understand why they do what they're doing and what they're being paid for, the more they might appreciate it, um, especially on those days when they have those irate customers that come to the counter or the person that cusses at them and hangs up on them on the customer service line, um, you know, reminding them um, sort of their purpose in the greater picture. The vision is that courts are a service, that we provide a public service, that we are here to serve. We say that a lot. We're, we're public servants. We're just here doing our job. But the reality, or and the reality, is that we're a service. So we are here to help and to serve. And this starts with understanding or having calibrating our views of resources. And I would sort of challenge all of us, myself included, because we all have those days to get out of a scarcity mindset and towards an abundance mindset. And the scarcity mindset I think or I find is particularly common in courts where we are so consumed or obsessed with our lack of resources. I don't have enough people, I don't have enough money, I don't have the right technology, I don't have enough time. And most of that, if not all of it is true, at least half the days, but I would challenge us all to expand into an abundance mindset. Think about what might be possible. Think about what Zanel and Cradell were saying about our very compelling mission, what courts are here to do, and how do we use technology to get there? And it's not, I'm not saying it's cheap, but I'm saying let's use our imagination and think about how we might get there. And when we're talking about resources from your local court or your local funding agency or a state legislature or some other thing, have a list. You don't need to present the list all the time, but have thought about it so that if the opportunity strikes, and it will every economic cycle, you're ready. Right? So I challenge us all to think about that. And I think it'll make work a little more enjoyable as well. Right? And we all have those days. I just you know, wanted to share a little bit of that because I find that the scarcity mindset is just replete everywhere in every court I've ever been. And that's, that's just really unfortunate because we're here to serve. So, yeah. um, User-centered design and approaches. So just more specific ways to think about how we're here to serve others. What do our court users need? What do they expect? We've talked a little bit already about how we're not just here to provide the minimum statutory or constitutional requirements for folks. We're here to understand what they need to get by. And also, particularly today, we're here to meet their expectations, which are often quite high, right? And sometimes we can't, but we've got to understand it. And we've got to think about it. And we've got to try. Can't just, sorry, that's, I'm, I'm just here to follow the law and nothing else. Sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes it's not. Um, how about other users beyond just the court users, the various stakeholders of folks that come in our court? And I think in each locality, it's different. But all the different people from all the different backgrounds and all the different jobs that they might have coming in our front door and all the different people and all the different jobs coming in our back door. Um, how to enhance accessibility, equity, inclusion, and efficiency? I think just think about that question. I mean, how we haven't asked that enough today and we certainly haven't asked that enough over the history of our courts in our country. How are we going to answer that question in the future? And think about it now so that we can get ready. Right? A trauma-informed approach. Trauma-informed courts, um, both as employers and also as institutions that serve the public as a branch of government. How can we as an institution become more trauma-informed in our approach. And in particular for this presentation, what might we use technology for to get there? Um, relatedly is psychological safety. Um, and we'll get to a little bit later about how, you know, engaging employees. But the psychological safety, I think, is a, is a key uh, concept to think about as managers as we're thinking about engaging our employees and as we're thinking about engaging with court users um, providing psychological safety to folks will just sort of unleash hidden potential in people. 
and whether that's an employee or uh, a probationer or um, a court user or a litigant, um, will really unlock this inner understanding of who someone is and how we can better work with them and help them. And that's our service. That's our, that's our responsibility. Uh, digital equity. Um, we've talked and folks have, I'm sure, heard and read many things that, since the pandemic, especially about digital equity issues and how we can shift courts completely 100% from uh, uh, traditional or in-person to, to digital and these are some of the issues that we've been talking about. Um, the impact of technological change on access to justice, and that's a similar long-running debate, um, especially in the last few years. And so, you know, some of these things may not be new concepts, but we're listing them out as specific questions. So as you think about some of these things going forward, it's more concrete than, all right, I've got to think about what my court's going to look like five years from now, which may be a very, very difficult question to answer. So these are some specific things to, to get at. The only thing I would, I would add to this is um, my, my only advice strategically is um, look who's at your table when, when you're having these meetings and these discussions. So when you, when you start to think about um, your users' needs, um, it used to be just operations and administration at the table and you would come up with a new idea and, and, and process. Um, my advice is to always have the Roger Rands at the table, always have your IT people there from the beginning because those those roles are really starting to overlap a lot. And and I, I think Roger, you'd probably agree that you're far more involved in the business process these days than I mean, you used, you used, you used to be in your lane of IT. And it's important to have IT at the table at all times now because everything we do has some touch of technology and digital um, sort of mechanism, mechanisms in it. And I find that, you know, in, in Texas, our IT director typically has some of the better ideas um, just because he knows what's possible and what's not, what's not possible. Um, that'd be my advice is um, always have at least those two seats filled at the table when you're going and, and looking at what's po what, what you need to do and what people expect you to do. I, I threw these um, organizations on there. If, if you're from Miami or Tarrant County, or well, again, we won't talk about LA too much. Uh, may they rest in peace today. Um, th these are, are jurisdictions that are really embracing technology and, um, and have been embracing technology recently. Uh, Miami has um, a chatbot, I think the name is Sandy. Um, and, um, you know, Sandy was developed to take the place of you know, the people that were answering phones or answering emails, um, when they developed the, the, the chat or text bot, chat, chat bot, um, they saw a 96% decrease um, in the amount of people that were calling their call center um, in the first six months because those repetitive questions were being answered um, in, a, in a way using technology. Tarrant County has um, jumped on the bandwagon of artificial intelligence. Um, Tarrant County is using um, uh, bots to do uh, case processing. Um, so the, the people that used to um, intake, you know, all the cases and do the review of all the cases before they're actually filed, um, they have employed bots. Um, it was so efficient. Um, it was working seven days a week um, that it was pr producing too much work for the staff that had, had to actually put their hands on it. So they actually had to cut the hours of the bots because uh, they, were, they, were, they were too helpful. Um, because you know the recommendation with uh, with AI is um, always double check the work. So although the, the bots were doing all this work, there were people that were were going through it and double checking stuff and making sure that it wasn't making mistakes. LA has um, a lot of California jurisdictions have been really um, on the the technology bandwagon, um, portals, apps, um, AI. Um, I know that um, LA um, has been using AI quite a bit on redaction. Um, that we all know that takes a tremendous amount of time. Um, it also takes um, a, a lot of uh, hand-holding because uh, that's really sensitive data, and if, if any of that's missed, that's a problem. Um, but is, is, is this helpful from the perspective of the customer? Um, do you like calling into phone trees? Um, do you like chatting with a bot trying to get the information you need? Um, is, from the customer's perspective, are, are these technologies helpful or even um, appealing? 
Yeah, I, I think it really just depends on, on what you're trying to do and um, what they're using. Um, you know, I, I know that with the whole airline fiasco, um, a lot of airlines were leaning on uh, their social media team to take care of all the fires instead of the, the people answering the phones. Um, although that's not necessarily like AI, but that's using a form of, of technology that really helped them. Um, so, you know, I, I think courts jumping on these technology bandwagons is, um, I think courts feel it's risky. Um, the, the backfire could be severe. Um, and just the implementation uh, takes a lot of resources. But um, I encourage you to, to do some Google searching if you're curious. Um, this session is not about AI or anything like that. But if you want to see what they're doing, um, these are three jurisdictions that have really uh, taken off in, um, in a digital way. Yeah, and as you think about some of the specific initiatives that Jeffrey mentioned or others that you may have heard of or colleague sends to you or a judge sends to you and says, check this out and think about it. I guess I'd commend again, the, the high performance court framework from the national center. And so they uh, lay out these four different perspectives here. Think about these initiatives from the customer's perspective, from their internal operating perspective, from the learning, learning and innovation perspective and the financial and societal value perspective. And that'll help you, I think, understand, or at least uh, think through the, the is this worth the time, the effort, the money um, now? Maybe next year it might be, but is it worth it now? And if the answer is not now, but next year, then what can you do to get there? And if the answer is not ever in my particular community, then look at it again in a year. So, um, case management systems used to be, you know, the way we always imagine case management systems were just it was the document, an information repository, right? It was where we stored all the information about a case. It was just, it's where we inputted in, you know, in those black and green screens, uh, at least that's that's what I grew up with. Um, and I know a lot of courts still have that, but that that's what case management systems were. They just stored the information so that we could get it later when we needed it. Um, in this new age of, of technology, are you using your CMSs a little differently? Are you, are you thinking about what a new generation of a CMS could do for your court and your customers. Um, a lot of new case management systems are just sort of becoming this portal to make our lives easier and they're making it easier for customers to interact with us. Um, it's, it's pushing the information out um, so that people can just find what they need without calling, without searching, without coming in. Um, you know, uh, I, you know, people are able to conduct financial transactions um, through the CMSs. Um, you know, it enabled to, a way to do online mediation and online dispute resolution, um, you know, but those, those resources are very costly. Um, and so not everyone has those options, but, you know, I, I really just encourage you to think outside the box of what your CMS actually could do, the potentials of it. Um, you know, when you go to the vendor fair on, uh, on Wednesday, you know, talk to these, these vendors and talk about sort of those larger benefits, um, you know, not just the document processing, not just, you know, um, you know, these quick portal screens for, for our, our, our staff to be able to do the, the transactions quicker, but, you know, what, what is the potential uh, benefit for our customers um, beyond just what, how it benefits the court? This slide, I mean, it sort of gets to the thrust of where this presentation is headed, which is that for courts and technology, especially in recent years, and what we believe to be going forward, leadership, as much as it has always been important and absolutely a difference maker, being proactive will become increasingly important, is what we'd argue now and going forward. And many aspects of leadership and how to do it and the ways to engage, many of that works. Um, but we would argue that being more proactive, being more out there, understanding what's aware, what people are doing, what people are thinking, um, is only gonna become more and more important uh, for operations generally, and then more specifically for driving the digital innovation of the institution, not just to respond to digital um, uh, things that are happening to your court or in your community. Um, and as, you know, I don't wanna, I'm scaring myself. I don't want to scare other folks. Two, two other things I'd add is one is to really pay attention to the nuance on that. 
and think hard about not only the resource that it's going to require, I think that'll come naturally to you, but the, the stakes that are involved. Is this something that warrants that? So I guess two, two other things I'd add is the stakes and um, really accurate projections and trying to hone your skill as to making an accurate project, uh, projection about what's going to matter when, how much resources it's going to take, what kind of resources it's going to take. And those are skills that can be refined and should be refined in years going forward. And how to calibrate and how to, how to get better at projecting things, whether it's not only data, but input from who, which stakeholders, what kinds of decisions. Those are two areas that I think can, those are skills that are learnable and will be increasingly important going forward. Understanding the stakes and how that impacts and how that weighs versus the resources that it takes to do something um, and how I can make better projections as a manager, as a colleague, or as an advisor to a colleague. Why people, purpose, communities, and planet. So as we're going through recruitment and retention challenges, these are four areas that we can think about. How do we compare to our competitor employers? Other government agencies, private sector, nonprofits. How do we compare in these areas and how do we make a compelling case? As the plenary speaker that spoke this morning, we have a really compelling case. We do really important and really good work. And we already know that we're, we have a vision and a reality of service. So these are just sort of four areas, again, that I'd commend that you think about these four, th four categories and how we make that pitch. Um, strategies for overcoming resistance to change. This is standard leadership 101, the relationships, uh, the feedback, the listening. Um, is change being forced? Are you forcing it? Is it being forced upon you? The sort of natural things that we, natural challenges that we meet and how to work through some of those things. Um, sufficient focus on organizational change management, champions at all levels, is there buy-in, alignment of mindset and goals, stuff that we've seen over and over, but good to think about some of these things more specifically. Strategic workforce planning, uh, developing a skilled workforce for a digitally transformed court system and society, touched on a little bit of that, upskilling court professionals, hybrid versus in-person versus flex. What do our staff want and expect? I think we've all had many, many hours of uh, thinking about this and reading about it and debating it. Um, nothing groundbreaking that I can offer here, but I just sort of commend us all to, to continue to think about some of those things that are going to be ongoing issues. Um, but it is important to think about what other, company, what other companies and agencies are doing because those folks drove courts to Zoom. So we've got to at least understand where they're going and where they're coming from. Uh, diverse perspectives, sort of what, what Jeffrey was talking about, about having, you know, looking around the room, looking around the table, understanding um, where folks are coming from and who's not there and how to get them there to hear their thoughts and where they're going. New ways of collaboration among colleagues and partners, um, particularly during the pandemic when we were all limited by the amount of in-person engagement that we could have, we developed new ways to engage with folks. We found that we actually could make new contacts and make new friends and meet new colleagues and engage with people in different ways. And it was often because it had to be that way and it was expedient, but we've developed new ways of working and doing things. And I just hope that we all don't lose the skill of identifying that and, and being sensitive to when you're meeting a new person, figuring out and tailoring what is the particular way to do and engage with this individual on this particular issue. And how can I set this relationship up for long-term success? Is that was a skill set we all learned during the pandemic? Um, discretionary effort, increased satisfaction, and better work product. The discretionary effort, huge, huge concept as we're often struggling with, again, recruitment or retention challenges. And um, for many jurisdictions, the reality that the number of employees is just not going to reach the number that it was years ago, at least in the short term. And so how do we get the most out of our current employees and how do we uh, find a way to help them um, personally or professionally to get that added value of the discretionary effort. And this, this is nothing new for, for any of you. And I, I hope it's nothing new, but um, if anything, it's just a reminder um, that this is something that we need to be keenly aware of in everything that we do, particularly when it comes to technology. Um, there are just a lot of people that just can't adapt to what we want them to adapt to. They're just not able to for whatever type of 
uh, vulnerability they have. Um, so really it's just, it's just a heavy reminder to, for everything that you do, make, you, make sure you, you screen it through this population so that you're not leaving them out of what, what you intend to do. And this is, you know, I, I think something that I don't know if we really think about is, is those environmental impacts. Um, you know, have we lost touch with our society? You, you know, it used to be a big deal for courts to go and be in the communities. You know, it used to be a big deal to, to bring the judge and the clerk and set up shop so the communities could have greater access to our courts. And I feel like that's, those tables are changing a little bit because now we're almost forcing people to adapt to our new ways. Um, although, you know, it's, it's an easier way in some ways, are, are we, we're losing that personal touch. Um, so just something to think about of, uh, of being too digital heavy, being too tech heavy, um, and making sure that we still have um, some type of relationship with the community in which we serve. Yeah, and this slide again just sort of acknowledges that many of the traditional leadership tools continue to work very, very well. Um, continuous improvement, feedback loops, using data in your decision making, uh, measuring success with performance indicators, um, testing, monitoring, watching, shaping the culture. Uh, those things continue to work well. Um, and so if you've been doing them, continue to do it. If you haven't, because your particular style allowed for a little less on some of these things, I sort of respectfully suggest we all revisit. Because again, the thrust of this organization is that, or this presentation is that a proactive leadership style will become more and more important as the world is spinning faster and faster. Um, and proactive in terms of engagement, understanding what's going on in the world, in the community, with my employees, with my colleagues, with other courts and their jurisdictions. So if you have a crystal ball, pull it out now. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'd rather not be taken off guard like the, the pandemic did. Um, so who knows what's next? Um, I think a lot of us thought what happened four years ago was the worst thing possible. Is it? Was it? Um, you know, what, what was what happened a few days ago the worst thing possible? Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, it, the whole presentation is about being strategic and, and looking long term and being visionary and being able to pivot for what happens next because we don't know what's going to happen next. We don't have any control over what happens next. We're not driving the change, right? We're adapting to the change and the expectations. Um, are we prepared? Are we preparing our staff, our, our next set of leaders to be prepared for, for this? Um, we're not always going to be there. Um, are your courthouses on fire right now? Do you have people taking care of your courthouses? Um, you know. That's why it's really important to be proactive and not reactive. We don't have the time nor the resources to be reactive. Um, it's just not the, the best way to, to run our courts. Yeah. Just sort of wrap this up with our summary. Um, we've, we've all seen and experienced the new forces that are impacting the courts uh, with opportunities and challenges. Um, and it, it requires not just new and different tactical approaches and operational approaches to, you know, early in the early months of the pandemic to do what we used to do this way, to do it in a different way, but to think about where are we headed? And that, again, to me, we've got to think about the world differently and think about our purposes and responsibilities differently vis-a-vis -vis technology. I mean, think about Zanel and Cradell's wonderfully eloquent responses and how would you answer a similar question and say, all right, how do I use technology to do those things? Um, the evolving roles throughout the system, it's, we haven't been static for any of our jobs in any, in any part of the court, and it certainly has been similar in other parts of the justice system as well. Um, so think about some of that, the, the importance of leadership again, um, the importance of keeping your eyes on the purpose and strategically thinking about how you're going to get there, how you're going to accomplish this purpose um, when the circumstances are different and the ground has shifted. Um, the perspectives in the capitals, again, kind of reflecting back on National Center, 
uh, wonderful scholarly work, just looking at things in a different way. It's a different framework um, to stand a little bit differently and to look at a problem or look at a challenge a little bit differently and help sort of, again, explore our, uh, different aspects of our mind to, to help us imagine what, what could be possible. I'll just, I'll just end by saying, um, don't run from technology because you're going to lose. Um, you know, if, if you think about it in, in the sense of uh, the, uh, the hare and the turtle, um, of course, are the turtle. Um, and technology will always beat us, but we can be smarter about it. We can be more strategic about it and meet it halfway. Um, it's not going away. It's, it's just going to uh, envelop us even faster than we, we imagine. So um, be strategic in what you do. Um, I hope that um, some of these thoughts you'll take back to your courts, start asking some of these questions as you do your strategic and long-term planning, because I think it'll benefit you in the long run. And then um, last thing is, before you go to bed tonight, pray for our friends in LA. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone.